some of you guys, uh, we started over there. I brought with me these little booklets that we give out from Teller and LaCroix that are, uh, how many of you have a copy of my textbook? Single empowerment, a couple of you. Okay, in the, the appendix in the back, uh, you know, the whole book goes through, here are the principles of single integrity, here are some of the consequences. And in the, in the back appendix, I have a list of, here are some of the important design principles or design rules, best design practices, based on these problems and solutions using the essential principles. And we took the list of, here are the best design practices, guidelines, based on the principles described in the book. We took those best design practices and we put them in this little booklet. And I added a couple and, and edited a little bit. And so uh, from, uh, at Teledon LaCroix, we uh, put together these little booklets and we give them out. Um, a little bit of advertising because it says the Signal Integrity Academy on it. But they're nice little pocket guides for uh, 100 best design practices for cir circuit board design. Now, if you, I only brought some of them for the room here. If you didn't get one, I, we might have run out over on that side. If you didn't get one, uh, we also have a whole pile of them uh, just down the hallway at the, um, the swag store. They're all free, uh, so, but you can pick one up if you didn't get one over at the swag store over there. And uh, just for you guys, because you're special, you came to join us here, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret that you can take advantage of. The back cover of this, there is a coupon code, a promo code, so that you can access the uh, Signal Integrity Academy for free. Now, the Signal Integrity Academy, so I've gone around the world and done all these lectures and these classes, and we recorded all of the classes that I do. These are typically you know, two-day classes. We recorded them all, and we posted those recordings on our website, the Signal Integrity Academy. It's bethesignal.com. Uh, we usually charge a subscription for it, but all of you guys are special, and if you look under your chair, you're all getting, no, this is like Oprah, right? You're, all of you get, if, if you pick up the little booklet, uh, uh, there's a little um, uh, URL to go to. It's uh, teledynelacroix.com slash bogotin3. You go to that URL, and there's a little sign-in sheet where you can um, fill out a form in order to uh, get your uh, three-month free complimentary subscription to everything on the SI Academy, and you just enter that promo code that's on the back there. So uh, if you don't have one of the little booklets, grab one from the uh, swag store over there. Uh, and then at your leisure, you can go back and register on the website. And then you'll have access to all of our training. In addition to the stuff that's usually behind a subscription wall that you'll have access to. And you, get, you view the videos, you download all the PDFs, all that stuff. In addition, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today, we only have a really brief period of time. Uh, so there's a limit to what I can do, but so we're going to spend most of the time in some examples and demos. Um, but uh, to get a lot more of the background, I've been producing a number of webinars that are all completely free, uh, and we've posted them on bethesignal.com. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like, so you'll see where they are. So here is bethesignal.com. This is where the Signal Integrity Academy is. Uh, we... Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, when you sign up for your um, free subscription, you'll come over here to subscribe after you get your, your uh, email back. You go here, log in, and then you can access all of the, um, the, the six different classes. You go to any of these uh, pages here, and then um, here are uh, all the classes, the, the lessons, the lectures that are within each of these classes. So you can uh, take a look at them. So here is... Uh, Here's the list of all the lessons. You click on those and, and you can view the video and download the, the PDF for them as well. Well, um, in addition, over here on the home page, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, we have a list of all the webinars that I've done. So we have this one, let's see. Oh, no, this has already happened, so we gotta update that one. That happened uh, last week. Uh, and over here, we have all of those webinars that I've done. They're all listed. You can browse through and uh, look at, uh, watch any of them, the ones you want. You click on that link. It takes you to a little registration page. You fill that out, and you'll get a link to view the video, the, the webinar recording, and download the handouts from it as well. So everything I'm going to talk about here has been recorded in one of these webinars, and you can take a look at them at, at your leisure. We have a whole series of these planned. We really decided to... Uh, put together an entire curriculum on um, high-speed interconnect characterization. How do you use best measurement practices 
in order to characterize the electrical properties of interconnects. And we have two series, so 12 webinars altogether, two series. The first series is the TDR in particular. The second series is a more advanced unit that's really a four port network analyzer. And it's about the series in there is about S parameters, thinking about them in the frequency and the time domain as well. The new information you get from uh, four port time domain, single ended and differential uh, uh, interconnect characterization. So you can browse through all of these webinars at your leisure. So a lot of additional information for you. Uh, okay, um, let's see. How many of you currently use the TDR? Wow, only a couple. Okay, good. How many of you use information that you get from a TDR? How many of you have heard about a TDR? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so uh, that's fine. I'm going to give you a really brief introduction to what does a TDR measure and why should I care. Uh, and I'll give you the punchline. And then we're going to look at, I only have you know, half an hour or so here. So I really want to spend the time doing some examples to show you what does the TDR response look like and how do we interpret it. But the bottom line is, if you have a question that is about the impedance of an interconnect, trace on a board, a connector, a cable, some interconnect, if you care about something related to the impedance of that structure, TDR is a valuable instrument in order to tell you about the impedance. But it's a special kind of impedance that we measure. If I have a transmission line, what, 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 what is a transmission line? What's it take to make a transmission line? What do you need to make a transmission line? So one of the, there, there are four important principles behind the performance of a transmission line. We'll just spend five minutes total talking about them. Uh, then we'll look at the examples. Um, you know, I said in my keynote that I think it is really important to learn how to translate what you learn in the classroom, the essential principles, into, OK, so what? How do we use that to help us solve problems? And when it comes to properties of an interconnect, there are four important principles. The first is all interconnects are transmission lines, period. All it takes is a signal and a return path. Unfortunately, we sometimes call the return path ground. It doesn't matter what the DC voltage is. All that's important is proximity. So there's signal and return path. Every, every interconnect is a transmission line. Guaranteed, there is a return path. If you can't see it, that signal is going to find a return path. And, and if you're not engineering it yourself, you're probably not going to like the return path it, found, it finds. So all interconnects, all transmission lines, signal and return path. Second is signals are dynamic. Once a signal, a voltage, is launched between the signal and return path on a transmission line, it will propagate. You cannot stop it from propagating. Because a signal, when I, here's my transmission, as a coax here. Here's my signal. I launch a, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab one of the slides here to, to kind of show this in a little more detail. Ah, here we go. So here's, uh, here's my transmission line. So here's my signal and return. When I launch a voltage on that transmission line, I change the, I turn the voltage on. When I go from zero to one volt, what, what have I produced in this region between the signal and return path when I put one volt across it? A field, an electric field. I've changed that electric field. There was nothing there initially, and now suddenly there's some electric field, right? I changed the electric field. And what does a changing electric field make? Now, I, I want to encourage participation here, so I brought some treats with me, but you have to shout out because I, I can't see too well. So uh, let's see, who said electric field initially? There you go, okay. Oh boy. I don't, oh, good duck, good duck there. I don't know why you guys that like to participate sit in the back. It just makes it harder for me. Okay, so you get an electric field. So between the sig signal and the return path over there, Let's see, somewhere over there. Between the signal and return path, you get an electric field when the voltage turns on. While it's turning on, that field is changing. And what's a changing electric field create? What's a changing electric field? I mean, it does produce displacement current. We'll talk about that in a second. But what else does a changing electric field create? A changing magnetic field. So you don't have to get the right answer to get a, a, a reward. <laughs> Participating is the important thing. Uh, so you, the changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field. And what's a changing magnetic field create? A changing electric field. And that changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field. And what have we just created? 
we've created self-propagating light. And that was one of the innovations that James Clerk Maxwell introduced when he kind of unified some of the principles that have been sitting around for it. He realized that there is a connection between changing electric field, changing magnetic field, and would self-propagate. That is basically what light is. And so as soon as we introduce a uh, voltage between the signal and the return path over here, that change in electric field creates a change in magnetic field, creates a change in electric field, and that propagates. You cannot prevent that from happening. It is literally built into the fabric of space-time. It is light that we've created. And it's going to propagate down the transmission line at the speed of light in that material, which in air, what's the speed of light in air? Yeah, easy number to remember. A foot per nanosecond. It's a foot per nanosecond in air. You throw a dielectric around it, and it's going to slow the speed down with the square root of the dielectric constant. So it's, you know, dielectric constant of our four is like four. Square root of that is two. So instead of 12 inches per nanosecond, six inches per nanosecond, the speed of the signal. So you launch a signal into that transmission line, and it's going to propagate. Here's an example of that. Here is in yellow is the, you're looking at top view of a microstrip. The green is the return plane. We're going to measure the voltage or simulate the voltage between the signal and the return when we launch that voltage. Initially, we're going to plot that voltage dynamically. Here it is. Here's voltage versus position dynamically. And let's turn it on and, and, uh, and see. Let's see. There we go. And there it is. There's that signal that's propagating down the transmission line. You cannot prevent that signal from propagating. So you've got to recalibrate your intuition of signals are going to propagate down that transmission line. You can't do anything about it. It's going to happen. Sec that's the second principle. Now comes the third principle, and the third principle is what the signal sees each step along the way. So here is what I think the most, one of the most important principles in signal integrity. Uh, and when I tell my students uh, that they're going to learn a certain principle that this is really, really important, I always show them uh, this uh, illustration to emphasize how important this spot is. So here's a Gary Larson cartoon. You get the big old mastodon they've shot with this little arrow. And here are the two cavemen. One's talking to the other and says, we should write that spot down. That tiny little arrow took down that huge mastodon. Well, this is one of those principles that are so powerful, we're going to solve big problems with it. We need to write that spot down. And this is the third principle. Uh, by which uh, signals interact with interconnects. And it's really the basis of you know, most of signal integrity issues. And it is what electrical property the signal cares about as it's propagating down the interconnect and what that uh, property is. So if I'm a signal uh, and I'm, I'm walking down this transmission line, so we're going to imagine here's a signal that's traveling at 6 inches per nanosecond. It's that voltage between the signal and the return. It's propagating. As I step down this transmission line, I encounter more and more of the interconnect. What do I care about electrically? What's the most important electrical property of that interconnect that I care about? Who said impedance? You got it. It's the impedance. Each step along the way, that, this is how it works. You, I ask a question, you answer it, you get a little treat. Each, each step along the way, that signal sees an impedance. And now we're going to calculate what is that impedance. Well, what is the... Uh, Definition of impedance no matter what. Impedance is always. Oh, we got a ringer over here. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, impedance is voltage over current. So the voltage part, that's easy. That's the one volt that I'm applying. The current, that's the harder one. What's the current associated with that signal as it's propagating? Well, here's how we're going to think about it. So here I launched my signal down this transmission line. And we're going to do a kind of a Zen thing. We're going to be, be at one with the signal. We're going to become the signal. We're going to, as my website says, we're going to be the signal. We're going to ask, what do we see as we walk down this transmission line? So here we are. We're that one volt signal. And we're walking down this line. And each step along the way, we're leaving one volt in our wake. Right? Before we step, there's nothing. After we walk by, there's one volt between the signal and the return. Well, that signal and return, there's some capacitance in my footstep when I step down. And when I step, I have to charge that up to one volt. And then the next step, I have to charge that up to one volt. And the next step, I have to charge that up to one volt. And so as I walk down this transmission line, I have continually, I'm continually dumping charge in each footstep to charge up this footstep and this footstep and this footstep. And if I'm walking at the same speed and I'm taking the same size footstep and the cross section is uniform, then I'm dumping the same charge in this footstep and this and this and this. And so as I walk down that transmission line, what can you say about the current 
come in on my foot to deposit the same charge in the same amount of time. It should be the same. It's constant. And so I see on the signal, we're going down the line, there's a constant current flowing into that transmission line from the signal. That means that the impedance that I see is constant. That instantaneous impedance I see as I walk down this transmission line each step along the way, that instantaneous impedance I see is constant. It's the same. Okay, here comes a trick question. I'm in the middle of the transmission line. I'm about to take the next step. And I double the length of the transmission line. What happens to the impedance of my next step? It doesn't change because it's just about how much charge I have to dump in that footstep and how long I have to go to the next one and the next one. It doesn't matter where the end of the line is. I double the length of the line, the instantaneous impedance doesn't change. If, if I have a uniform transmission line, so the cross section is the same, I, I'm going to see the same capacitance in each footstep. I'm going to see the same current coming on my foot. I'm going to have the same instantaneous impedance down this transmission line. And that means that this one transmission line, a uniform transmission line, has one value of instantaneous impedance that characterizes it. We need to give that a special name. What should we call it? The characteristic impedance. The characteristic impedance is just that one value of instantaneous impedance that characterizes the transmission line. If I know the characteristic impedance, I know what is the instantaneous impedance a signal is going to see when it walks down that line. By definition, only a uniform transmission line has a characteristic impedance. Because if it's not uniform, if the cross section changes, the instantaneous impedance changes. And that means that there is no one value of instantaneous impedance that characterizes it. There are multiple values. There's no one characteristic impedance. So it's only a uniform transmission line that has a characteristic impedance. Last principle, and this is the so what. Why do I care about this? So the last principle is this idea of what happens when that instantaneous impedance the signal sees changes. So I walk down this line. I see 50, 50, 50. I keep on propagating no changes, no problems. Keep on going, seeing that same instantaneous impedance. But if I encounter a change in the impedance, I get a reflection. And the reflection is related to and, and so it depends very much on the propagation of the signal. It's propagating along, sees 50, 50, 50. Uh-oh, I see an impedance change. Some of that signal reflects, and some of it transmits and gets distorted. How much reflects, that ratio of how much reflects to what is incident is the second guy's impedance minus the first over their sum. So if this is 75 and this is 50, I go from 50 to 75. The second guy's 75 minus 50. That's 25 over the sum, 125. 25 over 125 is? One-fifth, 20%. So one volt goes in, how much reflects? One volt. Uh, sorry, one volt goes in, 20%. 0.2 volts reflects. And so I have two waves on this interconnect. I have one wave going this way of one volt. I have one wave going this way of 0.2. If I stick my scope probe right over here between the signal and return, what am I going to measure with my scope? I'm going to measure one volt going in, 0.2 going this way. I'm going to measure 1.2 volts. And this is one of the most confusing parts about signals on interconnects, partly because of how we learn signals with a scope. Now, I work for Teledyne LaCroix. We're the third largest manufacturer of scopes in the world. Who's number one? Tektronix. Who's number two? Keysight. You know, you have to go through your head. Oh, it's HP. No, it's Agile. No, it's Keysight. I don't know what it's going to be next, next month. It's Keysight, number two. We're number three. So it's, you know, pretty large market share for oscilloscopes. And so I mean this only in the most loving way, but if you learn signal integrity by looking at an oscilloscope, it screws up your intuition. Because an oscilloscope tells you nothing about direction of propagation of the signals. All it tells you is the voltage that you measure. You can't tell when I measure 1.2 volts over here between the signal and return, you can't tell that I really have one wave going in a 1 volt and one wave reflecting a 0.2 volt. You have to use your engineering mind's eye in order to see the underlying process of what's going on there. So this is the basis by which the TDR works. Now let's talk about the TDR. And I'm just going to show you just real briefly, and then we're going to look at a bunch of examples. So here's our TDR. This is actually a differential TDR. We'll see the impact of that in a second. We're going to look at one channel first. So that's single-ended. And the TDR works by sending out a fast pulse. This is our signal that goes out. And, um, and we're going to uh, have it encounter some device under test. 
if it encounters the same impedance everywhere, then what's going to be reflecting back to us? Nothing. Nothing. So we're not going to see anything. So we're just going to, we're going to look over here uh, with a really fast scope. This is a sampling scope. It samples every 10 picoseconds. So it's really fast. Uh, it takes about a 100 milliseconds of signals going out and measuring them to get a complete buffer's worth of, of 10 picosecond intervals of, of the measurement. So we're going to look here. We're going to look at the voltage. And this is coming from a 50 ohm source. And so if it's one volt from here in 50 ohms, we're going to get a half a volt launched into the transmission line. We're going to look over here with our really fast scope. Uh, the signal is going to come down here. If there's a reflection, it's going to come back. And looking over here, we're going to see any voltage in addition to what we sent out, any change from that had to have come from a reflected signal. And that's how we're going to separate out the incident and the reflected signal. And so we're going to look at what that reflected signal is, and we calculate the reflection coefficient. Here's the reflection coefficient. It's how much reflects compared to what was incident. We know the incident. We know the reflected value. That's the reflection coefficient. And now if we know the reflection coefficient, and we know it came from a change in impedance, well, with a little algebra, we can calculate what that change in impedance is. And we can literally map what is that instantaneous impedance profile the signal sees. So let's take a look at some. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to send that pulse out. We're going to look at the reflected signal. And we're going to translate the reflected signal into the impedance profile. And it gives us a window into what's going on with that, what a signal would see uh, walking down that transmission line, mapping out that instantaneous impedance. So let's take a look at some examples. So um, I brought my TR with me. We're going to look at one, one channel first, single-ended. Uh, and we get the end of the cable here. Um, I always recommend when you first start out doing a measurement, there are two important measurements to do, just as kind of calibrations so you can orient yourself with the, with the instrument. The first is we're going to look at an open. So we're going to send a signal. It's, it, it, I've done the calibration. Signal's going to come out of the TDR. It's going to go through the cable over here, 50 ohm cable, and that's going to hit the open. What's the reflection coefficient from an open? 100%. One. So a half a volt goes in, half a volt's going to reflect, and we're going to see that coming back. We'll see a half a volt reflecting. We know it's half a volt going in. Reflection coefficient is 1. We'll see the step response, and it'll look like an open. So I'm going to turn on our scope. And we're going to look at an open. Now, whether I look at the second channel or not, I'm always sending a differential signal out. But we're only going to look at one of the channels for now. And then we'll look at the second channel in a second. OK, so I'm going to look at an open. Now, I notice I don't have the calibration on, so I'm going to just turn the calibration on. And I'm going to reload the last uh, three-tier calibration. So I've got the green lights on here, so now it's calibrated. And um, oh, let's see, I only want to look at one channel, so I'm going to change the mode here to look at just TDR. We'll look at differential in a minute if we have time. OK, I'm going to look at the open now. So one of the important best measurement practices is rule number nine. Before you do the measurement, think about what you expect to see. We're going to send that signal out. Uh, we should see uniform 50 ohm line, nothing reflecting back, nothing reflecting, and then suddenly all of it coming back. And it's going to be one time delay to go down, another time delay to come back. And that's going to tell us where the end of the cable is. So let's run that measurement. We're going to take um, uh, 25 averages, so it's two and a half seconds. Oh, then we're done. Here it is. Now I'm looking at, I translated that into impedance, but you know, that's really high, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, uh, turn that into, I'm going to turn that into uh, step response. So now we'll see, here it is. Here's zero, here's half, here's one. Sure enough, here is my uh, reflection coefficient of one. Uh, all of it comes out, and that's where the end of the cable is. Second measurement that I think is always important to do is a 50 ohm load, because that helps us get a calibration, uh, verify the calibration of the instrument. So I've got a 50 ohm load on here. Pretty good precision accurate than about a tenth of a percent. So I'm going to connect it in. And I'm going to use a torque wrench. And I'll show you why we want to do that in a second here. And now, what should we see as the reflection coefficient? Huh? Zero. Nothing's going to reflect, right? OK, so let's do the 50 ohm. So here's a 50 <coughs> ohm load. And let's let it rip. OK, that's really boring. I mean, there's nothing. In fact, to the extent that I don't even know where the end of the 
cable is and where the 50 ohm begins, that's why we took an open measurement. So now I'm going to combine them both. Now I see where the end of the cable is. Now, just to make it easier to think about it, I'm going to convert this into impedance. And what impedance should we see? If nothing comes back, what impedance does that correspond to? 50 ohms. So let's go to display it in impedance. And let's zoom in so we can really see the details of what's going on here. Okay, so we're at two ohms of division. And I don't know about you guys, here's where the end of the cable is. I don't know about you guys, but I am hard pressed to see where that 50 ohm resistor is. On this scale of two ohms of division, you can see a little bit of the noise. That's kind of the noise floor of the measurement. Uh, gosh, you know, if I, if I zoom in some more, see how much I can zoom in. <coughs> Yeah, okay, so here we are at 0.2 ohms of division. You can see we're about plus or minus, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 ohms peak to peak kind of variation here. It's 0.2 ohms per division here. So that's uh, less than half a percent. Gives you an idea of the uh, verified accuracy and the noise in the measurement. Okay, so that's our starting place. Now while we're here, let's, um, show, I'm going to show you why it's so important to use a torque wrench on the connector. I'm just going to back off a little bit and just kind of finger tighten it. Okay, what do you think you're going to see? What's the impact of not getting a good connection? Huh? So uh, what's going to happen to the impedance that we see, do you think? So let's take a look. So this is going to be 50 ohm loose. And we'll let it rip. There it is. And now I'm going to zoom out so we get this. And I want to compare it to a really good uh, uh, connection and also where the open is so we can see it. And I'm going to zoom in. And so what do you notice? Well, you get a discontinuity at the launch. So the green is the, uh, the 50 ohm load, but I just finger tightened it. I thought it was pretty tight. We see a discontinuity at the launch because we've pulled that pin of the center cable a little out of the socket it's supposed to be in. It's designed to be perfectly seated. That gives us that continuous impedance profile. And now we've pulled it out, and so we've got a little gap, a little space between the, uh, a little larger diameter in that gap. That little larger diameter is that higher impedance that we see. And, but you also see an offset. It's maybe like a half an ohm offset. How come? It's the contact resistance, exactly right. That when we seeded it in there, we got good contact between the pin and the signal path, and, um, and it dropped it down. But now, we've got a little bit of contact resistance. So that's why when we make a connection, it's really important to use a torque wrench to minimize that artifact, one important artifact. It also says that if there is some series resistance in the path, that will appear as an offset. It doesn't say, oh, the instantaneous impedance of the cable or the connection or the load is, is that higher impedance or increasing impedance. All it says is that in addition to the instantaneous impedance, there is a series resistance that I'm seeing as well. Real important to keep in mind. Okay, I brought a bunch of examples with me, and we're just going to look at a couple of these. You know, I said a minute ago that all interconnects are transmission lines. No exception. And so I just grabbed some cables that I had lying around, which are... Transmission lines, they're interconnects. Um, let's see, here's one. So I grabbed some speaker wire, uh, just stranded uh, uh, wire uh, with the plastic insulation uh, close together. This is a transmission line. Anybody want to hazard a guess what its impedance might be? Its instantaneous impedance? I'm going to send a signal down the signal in return, and I'm going to look at that instantaneous. It's a uniform cross section, so it's going to look at you know pretty good transmission line. It's not perfect. About 100 ohms. Okay, I have to remember to get rid of these because I'm not flying back with them. About 100 ohms. Okay, let's take a look. Now, normally in a TDR, you want to be really careful about ESD because that very fast signal is a little diode pulsar and it's really sensitive to ESD. Uh, and so you always want to have, you know, the ESD mat, a wrist strap, be careful about charging it. The TDR that I brought here, when I'm not taking a measurement, the end of the cable into the TDR is actually connected to a 50 ohm load, so I'm automatically discharging 
anything I connect to it. So when I connect, so I'm not being really careful, but you know, again, habits. A good habit is you always hold the shield on the coax with your fingers. That helps you discharge uh, any charge you build up. But even then, it's not important uh, because. Um, I've got a 50 ohm resistor connected between the signal and the return uh, inside the TDR when I'm not making a measurement. So I've discharged this cable. Now when I do the measurement, that's when I want to be careful uh, because then I've got the diode connected and uh, if you approach it with a large, you know, you can be a couple hundred volts, anything more than about five volts usually uh, burns out the, the TDR. So this is the uh, speaker cable. So let's take a quick look. Okay, where did it go? I don't see it. Well, that's because it's off scale, right? So let's rescale it. Here it is. And let's zoom in a little bit. So here we've got, here's this big discontinuity at the launch because whenever you have a signal in return by this uniform cross section, there's some impedance, in order to connect to it, in this particular case, I literally pulled the wires farther apart and then soldered them to an SMA. And by pulling them farther apart, what did I do to the instantaneous impedance? Increased it. And so we have the high impedance of the launch. And depending on what the geometry of the launch is, it'll be high impedance, it'll be a low impedance. So we've got the launch, and now we have the uniform part of the transmission line. And you know what? Not a bad looking transmission line. And you get another treat. You were right on the nose. This is 100 ohms. So this speaker wire is a perfectly good transmission line. Happens to be 100 ohm single-ended impedance. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of others. So I went around my lab, and when I first got my TDR, I went around the lab, and I looked at um, some of the cables that I had. See, these are RG174, the very flexible uh, 50 ohm cables. Uh, I bought them really cheap from Amazon. There's like three bucks each. Uh, and I said, hey, I wonder what these cables look like. I use them a lot, so I do a lot of demos with scopes. I do a lot of demos with you know, some high bandwidth measurements of of uh, 50, 100 picosecond kind of edges. Been using these because they're flexible, travel well. And I said, hey, I wonder what they look like. Let's take a look at one. So we're going to connect it in. And again, I'm going to try to use the torque wrench. What do you think you're going to see? Huh? Yes, very good. So at the far end, it's open. Yeah? And so we're going to see everything reflecting back. What else? Very good. So maybe it's not 50 ohm impedance. Excellent. What else? Where do you, th huh? Exactly. Why? Yeah, it's a, exactly what it is. Connection. It's a termination. You get the nice coax cable. That's great. That's wonderful. But when you connect it to the SMA at the front, you have to open up the braid and uh, get the signal wire out. You've got to you know, crimp or solder the shield to the connector. And so you are changing the geometry of that nice uniform coax cable. And so you're gonna have a launch discontinuity. So let's see what we get. So this is RG174-1. And here it is. And again, you know, it's close to 50 ohms, so it's off scale here. We'll bring it back on scale. And here we go. Okay, so you know what? It's not 50 ohms. We got the launch discontinuity. That's because of the termination. It's not 50 ohms, it's 54. And look, it's wandering a little bit. And I have to tell you, for the life of me, I move my fingers over this cable. I cannot feel any impact at all. It feels very smooth and uniform to me. Huh? It's some kind of a dis, that's right. The instantaneous impedance is varying down the cable for some reason, I don't know why. Can't feel the impact, and it's open at the, at the far end. And it's not 50 ohms, it's you know 55 ohms. Let's take a look at another one. Let's see, let's do this one. So why does that instantaneous impedance vary? That's the question you're asking. If the cross-section is uniform, it shouldn't. It should be the same instantaneous impedance. But in this cable, it varied. There's a high impedance over there. Not a lot, 
I mean, it's five ohms of division, so you know, maybe a two, three ohm excursion there. What, huh? Well, yeah, or something, maybe it's a variation in the, the braid has an opening there. Maybe the, um, the, the dielectric has a bubble in it over there. Uh, I, you know, feeling the outside, can't feel any difference. Let's take a look at another one. So this is going to be number two. And now, let's just compare those. Wow. So, you know, that one's not bad. It's got a launch discontinuity, and they're all about the same because of the, uh, you just pull the return far away and you solder it in there. Pretty darn uniform cable, and, you know, it's not so bad. It's 48 ohms. The RG174 uh, spec is uh, uh, 50 to 52 ohms. So, you know, it's a little under the spec, but it's still not bad. Very uniform. Very uniform. So I went through my lab, and I found 25% of the cables that I use look like that one or worse. That's actually one of the better ones of the 25%. In other words, you know, you, you, know, you get what you pay for, right? That uh, for three bucks, as long as I can sort them, I'll, I'll take a 25% yield hit. Uh, but you have to know which are the good ones and which are not. And some of the discontinuities I found were as much as a 10 ohm discontinuity. But all of them have the launch discontinuity. And that's predominantly what you're paying the big bucks when you buy a high performance cable. Like these cables here, yeah, they're uniform, but the most important quality is that the launch is done really well. That the termination of the cable into the connector is really uniform and you don't have a launch discontinuity like that. So, just a couple of quick examples. Now let's take a look at a couple of circuit boards. So I brought with me a couple of boards, a couple of traces on a board, and we're gonna look at the same thing. Now, there's just enough time to talk about differential impedance. So far, everything is about single-ended. We send a single-ended down. When we use, so let's take a look at, um, this line, that so I got a board. It's got some traces on it. We're gonna look at one of the signal lines. Let's do the uniform transmission line. Nothing fancy, right? So let's take a look at uh, this single line. Now, um, as a transmission line on a circuit board, what do you expect to see? It's just a uniform transmission line. It's about six inches long. Well, so it does, but take a guess. I mean, this is rule number nine. It's thinking about what you expect to see ahead of time. It should be relatively uniform, right? And maybe on the order of about 50 ohms. Well, of course, we're going to have a launch discontinuity at the, at the beginning, right? So let's take a look at this. So this is A, trace A, and this is the single-ended, because we'll see the differential response in a second. Okay, ka-chunk, 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 averaging, we're done. And here it is. And it's about a nanosecond to go down and nanosecond to come back. And we see the um, launch discontinuity over here. We see, you know, relatively uniform. This is one ohm of division here. So it's relatively uniform, but hey, you know, we got this, you know, plus or minus an ohm variation other than the launch here, plus or minus an ohm variation on that transmission line. Hey, you know, welcome to the real world. Um, what's causing that impedance variation? Maybe. Some aspect of the substrate, maybe. What else? Huh? Maybe the copper etching, yeah? Maybe the trace thickness variation. All those are possibilities. I don't know which one it is. But when you look at traces on a board, you're going to see some natural variation. You think about it, that's really a small amount. It's only about an ohm, a peak peak of an ohm variation down the line. So it's not so bad. The uh, uh, Okay, so that's single-ended. But what we are oftentimes interested in is not just the single-ended impedance, but the differential impedance. And so here's what that means. When I apply a differential signal, I'm driving the pair with a differential signal. So what is that? If I have a pure differential signal, if I go 0 to 1 volt on one line, what's the other voltage doing? 0 to minus 1 volt, right? So the average is always 0. There's no common component. Pure differential. So you go 0 to 1 on 1, 0 to minus 1 on the other. And I'm going to send a signal down this guy, and I'm going to look at what comes back. If I don't do anything to the other line, so it's sitting there floating or connected to ground, then whether I move him close or far away, not going to have a lot of impact on this guy's impedance. 
as long as I don't get it really close. Spacing no more than, than alignment away. So I look at this guy's impedance, and if the other guy is, is coming in and moving, its impact is really small on the single-ended impedance of this guy that we've been looking at so far. But now, I take the other line, and instead of keeping it ground, I'm going to apply the opposite voltage. So this one's going to go 0 to 1, this is going to go 0 to minus 1. Any of those fringe fields that were going between this signal line and the other signal line that was then going to ground and contributing just to his single ended impedance, any of those field lines now see a 2 dVdt. This one's going up, this one's going down. And with 2 dVdt, I get twice the current that's flowing between these two guys than I had before. What we were looking at in this case, when I just had one signal going into the line, the other line was, was floating, was the single ended impedance. But now, I'm going to, on that other line, I'm going to drive an opposite signal. And so when I drive an opposite signal, the impedance of this guy, is he going to increase or decrease or stay the same? I'm only going to look at this one guy that I'm looking at now, but I'm going to now apply another opposite signal on the other line. Is he going to increase, decrease, or stay the same? So here's what's going to happen. Remember what we said the basic fundamental definition of impedance was? What's impedance? V over I. So I'm sending a signal in, a voltage in. I look at how much current goes in and it has to return. And now I bring the second guy in from far away and I've got the opposite voltage. Signal current voltage goes up, voltage goes down. I get twice the dVt. I get more current flowing between this guy and the adjacent guy. And so going into this line it has to be more current because some of it's going to go over to this guy. And if more current goes in, what happens to his impedance? It goes down. And, and when I drive the second line with the opposite voltage, I'm going to see a lower impedance for this guy. So let's do that. So I've got the second line. Now, regardless of whether I look at it or not, I always have a differential signal coming out of this guy. And now we're going to drive the other line with this um, going low signal. And we're only going to look at that first line. But we're going to look at it when I drive the other line with opposite signal. And to, and so we're going to look at pattern A. It's not a lot of coupling between them. And now, let's look at that. And let's compare that to what I had. Now I'm going to rescale it here so it's easier to see. So. Remember, this red, that's what we had before. That's the single-ended impedance. This is the impedance of that line when the other is driven with a differential signal, where the pair is driven with a differential signal. I'm still, I'm looking at the same line, yet its impedance has changed, it's decreased. I need another word to use to describe this guy's impedance when I have it as part of a pair and I apply a differential signal. I'm looking at the first guy, that's the single ended impedance. That's easy, that's what we've been talking about. What do I call the impedance of the second guy when he's part of a pair and I drive with a differential signal? Now I reserve that word differential impedance for the impedance the difference signal sees. This is the impedance of one line when he's in a pair and the pair is driven with the differential signal. What do I call that? Odd mode impedance. That's the odd mode impedance of that line. The differential impedance is always twice the odd mode impedance. And so when I measure the differential impedance of a differential pair, what I'm really measuring is the odd mode impedance of one line, the odd mode impedance of the other line, when I apply a differential signal. And so the last measurement I'll leave you with, we'll take that differential pair that I've got here. Instead of measuring just the impedance of one line when the other one is driven uh, with a, the pair is driven with a differential signal, I'm going to take the odd mode impedance of this one, the odd mode impedance of the other line, add them up, and that's what we call the differential impedance. So let me change the mode there so we get the, oops. Let me see if I can do it. It's not letting me do the differential impedance. Well, twice that is the differential impedance. If I change the coupling between them, what's going to happen to that odd mode impedance? Bring them closer together, what happens to this guy's impedance? Bring them closer, the same dVdt, I get more current flowing through them, and the impedance is going to drop. Right. And so, since the differential impedance is twice, 
the odd mode impedance, odd mode impedance drops, differential impedance will drop as well. And you know what? With that, we're out of time. That's all the time we had. I've got all these uh, lessons about the TDR and examples and all these demos. They've all been recorded. They're all available on the uh, list of webinars on Be The Signal site. And before we quit, I want to uh, turn the floor over to Rachel over there. And she's got a couple of quick announcements. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming.